So hello, yes, welcome back to uh, day two of the uh, Business of Music uh, program. As I mentioned, those of you who were yesterday, I am going to be talking to you up until lunchtime today, sort of carrying on from where I left off yesterday. So uh, yesterday, you'll remember, hopefully, that we looked at the different ways that artists turn what they do into revenue. So we started the day, didn't we, by saying that if you are an artist and you want to do your music full time, you want to give up the day job, and focus on your music as a full-time pursuit, then you're going to need to make some money. Um, and uh, you, there are various ways you can turn what you do as an artist into revenue. The three key strands of the business are intellectual property and live performance and the fan relationship. So as an artist, you create intellectual property. So we talked yesterday, didn't we, about the different kinds of intellectual property. So songs are protected by copyright. Recordings are also protected by copyright but a separate copyright. We talked about the copyright in photography and, des and page design and visuals and how those are protected by copyright and can be monetized through merchandise. We talked a little bit about trademarks and how artists can trademark their name and then build products and do licensing deals around their brand. Okay, format today will be the same as yesterday um, in that I'm, I will talk you through this. I'll probably talk you through the first two sections, then I'll take some questions, then I'll talk you through the licensing stuff and the issues and then we'll take another set of questions before the break um, so we can take questions here in the room and those of you watching on the stream you can uh, send in your questions digitally and uh, colleagues at the back will ask them on your behalf okay so the digital market um, and I, I showed you this slide yesterday but the big trend in the recorded music market over the last what 10 15 years is the big shift from selling CDs to, to, to monetizing digital okay and we've all watched that uh, trend um, so CD sales peaked around about 2000 CD sales then went into steady steep decline between 2000 and 2010 um, actually Actually, in more recent years, the decline in CD sales is starting to slow. So CD sales are still going down, but they're not going down in quite the steep way that they were in the 2000s. Um, so there are still some markets where CD sales now are sort of almost leveling out. But we have now got to the point where worldwide the record industry, so that's the recorded music market, is making more out of digital than it is physical. Okay, We only passed that point actually uh, last Last year. Okay, in 2014 it was 50-50 more or less. Um, in 2013 we were still selling more CDs than downloads and streams worldwide. This all varies from country to country, genre to genre, label to label, but if you take all the figures worldwide it's only last year that we passed the point where now digital is bigger than physical. Um, and of the digital figures Last year, about half the digital income came from download stores like iTunes, and about half came from the streaming platforms. And that includes all the streaming platforms. So it includes a Spotify, Apple Music type service, it includes a Pandora type service, it includes YouTube type services. Um, but the streams were bringing in more just, well, it was about 50-50. So last year, downloads were still slightly ahead of streams. Um, however, this year, that's going to swap. Okay, so as of 2016, we are bringing in more money with our streams than we are our downloads, and we're bringing in more money overall, quite significantly now, from digital versus CD. Um, so the trend that we have seen for the last few years is that CD sales are in slow decline, downloads are in steep decline, streaming is booming. Okay, now some of the streaming services more than others, but the streaming sector is becoming ever more important. Um, in terms of these digital services that are out there, um, we can classify digital services into a number of different groups, and these are the main different kinds of digital services. That block that we had that said digital includes all of these. Okay, so all of these are counted under the digital services banner. Um, so we, the current dominant models, we have a la carte download stores, we have freemium what we're calling listen services, or you might call them personalized radio services, we have the, the free video services, we have the free on-demand services, we have the premium on-demand services, then we have some niche High, uh, high quality music services and a couple of services dabbling with limited catalog okay so those we can group all the services out there into these different categories so I stand out the way yeah. can you see that 
good. Um, to give you some brands associated with those, uh, if you can see those, the logos get small once we get to on-demand because there's quite a lot of on-demand services. But the, the big brands, um, so the Alicot download store um, is basically of the iTunes model. Okay, So um, when we talk about Alicot downloads, it's like iTunes. So you go into the store, you pay a dollar, you get a track, and it's yours for life. Um, in theory, <laughs> obviously, if you uh, drop your devices and they break, or you, uh, you, your hard disk breaks, um, then you could lose that content. Although, in theory, now that the content actually sits in the cloud, as we know, if you buy your music off iTunes, in theory, any Apple device you connect to your iTunes account, all the music should automatically appear. Um, so it is yours for life. Uh, just as an aside, it is for life. Uh, the license expires at the, at the end of your life. So, uh, you, in theory, you're not allowed to leave your download collection to your descendants um, because the license expires in those downloads once you expire. So um, technically it's yours for life. Um, so we're talking about services of the iTunes model here and really we're talking about iTunes. Okay, so iTunes is by far the biggest download store. Um, iTunes opened for business in the US in 2003, uh, then in UK in 2004, slowly started to roll around the world and became really, really big business. And for a while, iTunes was the single biggest seller of music worldwide, bringing in just on its own. I mean, at one point, digital income was, was nearly 90% iTunes income. Okay, so, so iTunes for a number of years was absolutely massive. Um, there are of course other uh, a la carte download services, so uh, Amazon MP3 worldwide is probably second. Uh, Google do have a download store. <laughs> People often forget that, but within the Google Play app store you can also download music. Um, and then there is uh, Beatport, um, which obviously specializes in dance music downloads. So in the dance music EDM space, Beatport became quite significant. And there are others, but those are probably the big ones. Um, iTunes is still a very significant player as a download store, um, although iTunes download sales are now declining month on month. And there's been rumors recently that Apple are basically bored of selling downloads. All of their priority now is the Apple Music streaming service, and a rumor keeps going around saying, oh, Apple are going to shut down their download store. Um, it's not going to happen for a few years yet because uh, they're still bringing in good money. But that is the rumor that keeps going around that Apple have fallen out with their download store and for them it is all about streaming. If any of you use Apple, the Apple Music app on an iPhone, um, you will know that when you go in there to try and play the MP3s that you downloaded, uh, it really tries to make you sign up to Apple Music. It makes it very hard to find your mp3 collection. So Apple is very much pushing its, its other digital service now. Um, beyond the Alicot download services we have the personalized radio services. Have, have you, any of you used a Pandora? type service. Um, so personalized radio, it sort of is halfway between radio and, and, and the sort of the Spotify type streaming service. So with Pandora, you go in, you tell it an artist that you like, and then it will play you probably a track by that artist, and then it will start playing you a personalized stream of music based on what it thinks you will like. Uh, because you picked, I don't know, Taylor Swift as your first artist, it will then start playing you music that it thinks you will like because you like Taylor Swift. Um, you can skip those some tracks on a free account. There's a maximum number of skips you can do, but you can skip some tracks. And in theory, the system's meant to learn. So when it plays you a track, I don't know, you, you ask for Taylor Swift, after that, what could it play you? Um, let's say it plays you a Rihanna track after the Taylor Swift track. You then skip that track. The system is then meant to learn, oh, they didn't like that track, we won't play them that track ever again. Okay, so that's how personalized radio works. The key thing is, though, it's not a fully on-demand experience. You can't go in and say, play me this full album now. You can't go backwards and forwards. It's just a steady personalized stream with limited functionality. Um, the biggest of those services is Pandora. Um, the next biggest is iHeartRadio. These services are only really available in the US. Um, they are also available in Australia and New Zealand, but the, the vast majority of the listeners are in, Pan uh, are in the US. Both Pandora and iHeart have 80 million active users each. 
Okay, so 80 million users using Pandora, 80 million using iHeart. They're only really available in the US. So that's in one market. So in the US, these services are massive. Um, there are licensing reasons as to why these services have become so big in the US and haven't really taken off anywhere else. And I'll come back to that when we look at the licensing. Um, you've then got the video platforms. YouTube obviously is by far the biggest. You also have Vivo, which technically is its own platform, but most people access Vivo through YouTube. Um, so we'll come back to them later. Then you've got the on-demand services. So unlike Pandora, unlike Personalized Radio, these are the services where you can go in and you can say, play me this album now in full. Actually, don't play me track four and track six. Um, actually, I want to go back and start listening again. Full functionality. It's, you, know, you can go in and listen to whatever you like, whenever you want. Um, and obviously, there are the free on-demand services and there are the paid-for on-demand services. Spotify is both. Okay, so Spotify, a free level, you can, you can have it as advertising play every few tracks to pay for it and then you have the paid for version and generally the paid for versions in the US they're always ten dollars a month in uh, the UK they're always ten pounds a month and in uh, the rest of Europe they're ten euros a month um, around the world they vary depending on what the economic equivalent of ten dollars might be okay but we have the free on-demand services and then the paid for on-demand services we then have some uh, niche high quality services, so things like Tidal um, and Deezer have an, a, a, a high quality version. So these are services which say, if you pay us double the money, we'll give it you at CD quality. Okay, because streams are never at CD quality, they're at MP3 quality. And so they'll say, well, you pay us double the money and we'll give you better quality music. Um, it's a niche product. Most people don't care. Actually, most people can't tell the difference. Uh, we did an experiment in London. Uh, Dolby have a theatre in the middle of London. We went in there, we played a whole lot of music industry people, and a, a high quality MP3, and then a, a WAV file, which is what you'll get on the high quality version, and most people couldn't tell the difference. Um, however, for a niche audience, they, they like that idea. I pay double and I get higher quality audio. Um, so there is a little bit of potential there. And then we have what I call the limited catalogue services. Um, so Amazon Prime is probably the main one of these. So most of the music services out there try to be massive catalogues. So the Spotify, Apple Musics of this world have in excess of 30 million tracks in their catalogue. Deezer has now tapped 40, topped 40 million tracks in its catalog and for all of those services it's all about having as many tracks as possible um, whereas Amazon Prime just has three million tracks actually I don't think it has that many I think it's about two million tracks they may get up to three million uh, eventually and and the offer of Amazon Prime is we don't offer you anywhere near as much music but you get the music in your Amazon Prime subscription, which is cheaper than a Spotify subscription, and also offers you video on demand, an ebooks library, and free delivery of anything you purchase off Amazon. Um, so, Amazon Prime music is one tiny bit of a much bigger package. So actually the music bit is getting much, 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 much less money than on a Spotify or an Apple Music. And so Amazon, what Amazon will say to the record companies is, but because we only offer two million tracks, we're not competing with Spotify. We're not competing with Apple Music. We're getting you people who will never pay $10 a month for a streaming service. So actually the fact we're only paying you a dollar a month, you should be happy with that because that's one and a half. Uh, well, they reckon they've got a few million users. So let's say it's three million users. That's three million people, that's three million dollars that you would never have previously had. Um, so Amazon Prime is what I call a limited catalog service. So let's quickly go through the, the, the big services and I'll give you their stats. Um, so as I said, in the US, Pandora and iHeart are the big two services. They're personalized radio services. They each have over 80 million active users. Um, iHeart only has a free level. It's paid for by advertising. Um, Pandora does have a paid for version, $5 a month, unlimited skips, no advertising, although the vast, vast, vast majority of their users are on the free level. Okay, so these are mainly free services funded by advertising. In terms of the on-demand services, worldwide the big two is Spotify and Apple Music. Um, so Spotify has 100 million users total, of which 30 million are paying. 
Okay, so 70 million on the free plan, 30 million paying $10, 10 pounds, 10 euros a month. Um, so Spotify is the biggest of the on-demand services. Apple Music comes next. Apple Music now has 15 million paying users. They don't have a free level. There's a free trial, but not a free level. Um, so they've got half as many users as Spotify. Although, having said that, Spotify has been going, what, it'll be eight years now? And Apple Music's been going one year. So it, it, the industry can't quite decide on whether Apple Music's been a massive success, you know, 15 million users in one year, half as big as Spotify, and they've only been around one year, Spotify's been around eight years. Is that a really massive success? Although iTunes has 850 million people who's put their credit cards into the Apple system. Okay, so Apple has 850 million existing iTunes customers to whom they can push this service. Plus, if you have an Apple smartphone, the minute you upgrade the software, the new, soft, the new music app arrives, and the minute you open it up, it tries to push the streaming service on you. So you could say, out of the 850 million people who could be signing up, 15 million is a bit disappointing. Um, or you could say, 15 million in a year, wow, that's a really good achievement. So you can have your own opinion on that. However, both of these services are currently adding users up to about a million new paying users a month. Okay, so somewhere between half a million and a million paying users are being added to both of these services every month. Um, and it is the paying users who are generating the income. So these services are the most successful and the ones to watch. Um, in terms of other services, Deezer was always seen as the second streaming service after Spotify, then Apple Music arrived, and now they're the third service. Actually, arguably, now they're the fourth service, because Tidal has, has, although the, the official figures don't yet show this, Tidal has actually overtaken Deezer. Um, Deezer is a French service. Um, most of their users are in France, so it's a massive deal in France. It hasn't really gained traction elsewhere, despite it currently being in 182 countries. So it, it has by far the greatest reach of all of the streaming services. Amazon Prime I've already talked about. So Amazon Prime isn't just a music service. It's a lots, it offers lots of services. Um, but the music element is currently available in four countries. So US, UK, I think Japan, and Germany. So it means that of the, uh, so, so in, the, in the US, it's $10 a month for the entire service. And of the $10, a little portion is given to the music industry for the, for the one and a half, two million tracks that they're making available through the Amazon Prime Music app. Amazon are also going to launch a full-on Apple Music Spotify competitor at some point, probably towards the end of this year. Um, so Amazon have ambitions in the $10 a month space as well as in this adding a bit of music to the Prime service that they are already doing. Um, any discussion of digital music services cannot ignore YouTube. Uh, YouTube is arguably the single biggest streaming music service on the web worldwide. Uh, YouTube has over a billion active users every month. Having said that, that's across the board. So they aren't necessarily consuming music. They could be consuming whatever else is available on YouTube. But nevertheless, it is a massive, massive platform. And a significant portion of the content on there is music content. Um, either it is music content that records labels or artists have uploaded to YouTube channels, or it is content that Vivo, which is actually owned by Sony and Universal, have uploaded to Vivo channels within YouTube, or it's content that random people uploaded um, on their own onto YouTube. Okay, And that might be that they stole a video off the TV and uploaded it. Um, it may be that they ripped a track off a CD and they put it to a slideshow and they uploaded it. Or it might be that they filmed their own video. Okay, They filmed a video on the beach, they filmed a video of them skateboarding, they filmed a video of their cat, and then they put a, a track as a soundtrack on that video and they uploaded that. All of those would be called user-generated content, um, even though technically some of it is user stolen content. Um, and um, user-generated content is treated differently from a licensing perspective. Um, but YouTube is massive. Um, it has a massive user base. It has massive consumption. It pays a lot less money than all of the other services. Um, and the key difference between YouTube and all of the other services is YouTube makes no minimum guarantees. All of the other streaming services have committed, because they had to, because the label forced them to, to minimum guarantees. So we'll talk about the deals in a bit and, and ultimately the streaming services were all on revenue share deals. So a certain portion of revenue is allocated to the music industry every 
month and actually it's over 70% so the majority of the revenue is going to the music industry. YouTube is the same in that YouTube have said well we'll give the label 55% of uh, advertising income and then we'll pay the publisher and we'll probably pay them 12% of advertising income. Um, the majors might get slightly better deals so they may be paying over 70% of their ad income once you combine the labels and the publishers together. Um, however there are no guarantees. So what Spotify and Apple Music have to do is they pass over a minimum amount of revenue, but 70% of nothing is nothing. So you layer on top of that minimum guarantees. So a service like Spotify or Apple Music has to guarantee that whatever happens, every time a track streams, the label and the publisher will receive a minimum sum of money. It's fractions of a cent, okay, but it's guaranteed income. And obviously for a Spotify free service, that's Spotify taking a huge risk because it means if they sell no advertising they still have to pay the labels this minimum per stream rate. YouTube don't do that. So what it means is if YouTube don't sell any advertising you don't earn anything. Um, if YouTube sell advertising but the advert has a skip and the person skips the minute the five seconds skips an option the advertiser doesn't pay any money so you don't earn any money. If, if the uh, YouTube sells the advertising and it doesn't have a skip but the user has put a little bit of software into their browser to stop the pre-rolls from coming because they don't want to watch a two minute advert then you don't earn any money. So as far as revenue share is concerned YouTube will say we're paying the same as everyone else we're paying 70% of the income over but the difference is no minimum guarantees. Um, so it means that YouTube's consumption is massive but the revenues are actually relatively modest. Um, the revenues also go up and down. In the run-up to Christmas, they're a lot higher because the advertising industry always has a boom in the run-up to Christmas. Whereas, you know, in March, April, no one's advertising, so there's no money to be made from YouTube. So, YouTube's quite a controversial point for the music industry at the moment. Uh, the music industry argues that YouTube is using a, a, a little bit of copyright law in the US and Europe in order to operate what I would call an opt-out rather than an opt-in streaming service. With Spotify, if you want your content into Spotify, you have to go to Spotify and provide your content. And if you don't provide your content, your content's not there. Um, whereas with YouTube, your content's already there because the chances are that somebody has already uploaded it, even though you didn't as the copyright owner. So with YouTube, if you don't want your content on there, you have to go to YouTube and pull it out. Whereas with Spotify, if you don't want your content on there, you just don't talk to Spotify and your content won't be on there. Um, so it's an opt-out service rather than an opt-in service. There's a bit of copyright law that allows YouTube to do that. Um, and the record companies and the publishers argue that that's how YouTube got these favourable terms and that it's unfair and the existence of YouTube is stopping the growth of Spotify and Apple Music or stopping those services reaching their true potential. And so basically the music industry wants copyright law rewritten in the US and in Europe um, to stop that from happening. They almost certainly won't get that um, but there is a side project going on that they think if enough pop stars moan about this in public even though they won't get the law changed um, they might ultimately embarrass YouTube into amending some of its ways voluntarily even if they can't get the law changed. But you can't forget YouTube, you also can't forget SoundCloud. SoundCloud's a bit like the audio version of YouTube it has many of the same issues as YouTube. The music industry didn't like SoundCloud two years ago. Uh, PRS in the UK sued them. But in the last year, SoundCloud has now changed its business model, started doing licensing deals, and for the time being, the labels and the publishers are back into liking SoundCloud. Although there's a bit of wait and see. They're saying to SoundCloud, OK, we've done the deals, we're not going to sue you now, you've got a year or so to sort this out, start paying us some decent revenues, and if that doesn't happen, well, one of two things will happen, which is either the labels and the publishers will change their mind about SoundCloud and start badmouthing them again, or actually SoundCloud's a bit on the edge itself. It needs to bring in more revenue, let alone what the labels and publishers want. So if SoundCloud doesn't get this sorted in the next year or so, there is a chance that they'll go under. Um, so... SoundCloud's an interesting one to watch. Um, just very quickly, some of the other ones. Uh, Tidal, uh, obviously now owned by Jay-Z's Rock Nation. Um, I don't know if any of you watched the press conference where they did the relaunch. Did any of you watch the press conference where they did the relaunch? It was probably one of the least successful relaunches in history. Um, having said that, Tidal, having had a big wobble when they tried to relaunch it and it was all a bit embarrassing, um, 
has started to really put on the users in the last six months. They are doing that through exclusivity deals. That is how Tidal is building its user base. So, you know, exclusive Beyonce, exclusive Rihanna, uh, exclusive Kanye. Um, so they're paying artists significant sums of money to only make their new material available by Tidal, for, for, certainly for a period of time. And that seems to be working because they have added, they've doubled their user base in the last, since they started doing those big uh, exclusives late last year. So it does seem to be working for the time being. Um, then you've got Napster slash Rhapsody, which is a really old digital music service that did nothing for about 10 years, reinvented itself as a streaming service, slowly starting to build some users, although not huge amounts. Beatport, I've already mentioned, um, dance music focused service, actually did very well by focusing on that one genre and really appealing to that fan base. Um, then tried to be a streaming service, that all went horribly wrong, so now they've gone back to just being a download store. Google, as well as owning YouTube, has a streaming service and a download service of its own under the Google Play brand. And then these ones at the bottom are important for the Asian market. So um, most of the services I've talked about so far are big in North America and or Europe, but actually once you get into the Asian market, you'll find that there are other locally based services that have gained much more traction. Um, so Guevara is an Australian service that is active in a number of Asian markets, although they are on the brink of bankruptcy, so they might not be with us. Um, in the near future. KK Box and Live Music and Beidou, or the music bit of Beidou, are all services native to the Asian market that are gaining more traction in that region than the, the European and North American services. So if you have a fan base in Asia, um, it is worth being aware of these other services because they are gaining more traction in that market. Just very quickly, the Freeman Challenge, and I'll take any questions that have come up so far. And I, I've alluded to this throughout. If we have a look at the sort of the approximate user figures as of now, um, of the main services that we've looked at, uh, the orange line above are free services, and below are paid for services. So above, the user doesn't pay. Okay, it's paid for by advertising. Below, um, the user pays. Okay, so in the US, Europe, they would be paying $10, 10 euros, 10 pounds, or the economic equivalent of that elsewhere in the world. So what you'll notice is, is there is a lot more users above the line than below the line. But the vast majority of the money coming in from streaming is coming from the services below the line. And so that's a challenge for the music industry. Now, you could say, in the olden days, most people got most of their music from radio, okay, which was free. And it paid nominal royalties to the music industry. It paid royalties, but nominal royalties to the music industry. Whereas a small number of people bought CDs okay, and generated most of the revenue for the record industry. So the idea that we have most people getting it for free and we earn a little, and then a small audience buying our premium price CDs, and that's where we make most of our money, that isn't new. However, the challenge in the digital age is that the free service and the paid for service looks very similar, whereas the radio experience and the CD experience are very, very different. So that's the challenge for the music industry. Do we try and cut off the free users? Do we try and shut down YouTube and SoundCloud and the free versions of Pandora and Spotify? Well, there are copyright law issues there, but even if we could get rid of the copyright law issues, do we really want to do that? Because these are great marketing platforms. The chances are that these people will never pay $10 a month to subscribe to a standalone music service. And so if we shut down the free services, we very, there's a big risk we will drive them back to piracy. Okay, and, and to, the, uh, to the illegal download services. And there are now some pretty sophisticated illegal streaming services out there as well. So the risk is that if we shut down freemium, we lose a marketing platform, we drive people back to piracy, and actually we don't then force those people into $10 a month subscriptions. So what do we do? And the music industry can't quite decide at the moment what to do. Um, one of the issues that some people have raised is that $10 a month is actually quite a lot of money. You know, most people used to buy two or three CDs a year maximum, okay? So therefore, $30, $40, maybe $50, depending on where, how the price point was in your local region. Um, we're now asking them for $120 a, a year. That's a, that's a big step up. And for core music fans who used to go and spend $40, $50 a month in a record shop, the idea of $120 for all music ever is a phenomenally good deal. However, for the more 
casual music consumer, which is most music consumers, it's a lot of money. And so what some people are saying is the problem at the moment is that we have free over here, we have $10 a month over here, what about something in the middle? Okay, why don't we have a uh, $2 a month service and a $5 a month service and then the $10 a month service so that music fans can pick the service that suits their needs and, and suits their you know, the money that they're willing to spend. The problem the music industry has is what is the $2 service? What is the $5 service? Arguably the free services are so good what could you have on the $2 service and the $5 service that would be better than free but not as good as the $10 service? And so that's the challenge that we're currently seeing. Um, it may be actually that the services in the middle are what we would call bundle services. Services where, like Amazon Prime, um, and actually YouTube now have a subscription service called YouTube Red, or things like Line Music in Japan, which is a messaging app that then layers music on top. We don't try and sell them a standalone music subscription. We add the music subscription in with something else and then we get a, a couple of pounds out of that. So it may be that the middle market, which is the, by far the biggest part of the market, um, will ultimately be driven by the bundle services. But I think the music industry is sort of in a digital experiment at the moment. Um, as someone who wrote about the music industry throughout all of this, the first five years of the 2000s, or say 98 to 2003, the music industry, in particular the record industry's response to the arrival of digital was no. Okay, and every digital service that rocked up to a record company, it was like, no, we sell CDs, we're not interested. And then around about 2003, 2004, Steve Jobs at Apple forced the music industry to license iTunes. And then it's worked. Okay, and suddenly they were making a flood of money from iTunes. So for the next five years, you had a period where the record companies were like, well, if you're going to be on iTunes, then yes. Okay, if you're going to be a download store like iTunes, we'll license that. But anything else, no. And then around about 2008, when people, I think the record companies sort of woke up that nobody knew what the future was. And trying to control the future wasn't going to work. And so around about 2008, the labels started to say, maybe. Okay, so if a streaming service came along or you know, an, a service that bundled music with a messaging app or whatever, these quirky new services came along, the label started to say, maybe, maybe we'll license you. And that began an experiment. And I think the experiment began in about 2010. And so we're now about halfway through that 10-year experiment. Ultimately, nobody knows where we're going to be in 2020. Um, we, have to, if we're going to, we need to be optimistic. We have to assume that the streaming services are just going to grow. And the advertising income probably isn't going to grow hugely. There's probably more ad income out there that we're not currently getting. But there's a finite amount of advertising income in the world. Whereas the premium subscriptions, if we could just market them better, get more people converted, I think windowing is going to be the future future where new music goes on premium services before freemium services. Um, and if we can do more of these bundle services for the middle market, then hopefully streaming will A, allow the recorded music market to stay static, which is more or less where it is, and more importantly, can we get the recorded music market to go back into growth? Because remember, from 2000 to 2010, the record industry kept going down, down, down every year. Since 2010, the recorded music market has been a pretty much flat. What the industry needs is for it to start to grow again. So the streaming services not only need to compensate for the declining CD and download sales, they need to enable growth. So there are some people who are optimistic, say we're in the middle of an experiment, some of these things are going to work, we'll slowly claw it back. And also remember, digital is a lot cheaper to run than physical. So we're talking about revenues here, but your, your profit margin should be higher. So actually, we're optimistic. We're going to make it by 2020, it'll all be fine. Other people will say we're very much on the edge. Um, all of the growth in the record industry at the moment comes from Spotify type services, Apple Music, Pandora. And the thing to know about every single one of these services is that they are all currently loss making. Okay, so actually the only people making money out of streaming are record companies and publishers and artists and songwriters. For all you see those articles in newspapers where artists say, the problem with streaming is we don't earn any money. And so well, actually the music industry is the only people earning any money. Spotify ain't earning any money, Apple Music ain't earning any money, Pandora ain't earning working any money because they're loss making companies. So the challenge is how do we A, make these companies profitable and B, do so in a way that we continue to earn as much as we're currently earning and actually significantly more. So we're in the middle of an experiment. It may or may not work. 
Um, and it, it will be interesting to see where we are by 2020. I mean, I would hope by 2020 we would start to see a bit of stability and knowing, yes, these are the services that are going to work. This is how we're going to marry freemium to premium. Um, and, and this is the future of recorded music.